All right, guys, welcome to Game 101. Uh, today, I'm going to go basically give you an overview of the fundamentals of pickup. So if a man's goal, a man's goal is to get as many grandchildren into the world as possible. There are basically two strategies he could employ. Okay? Strategy number one is have as many kids as possible. Right? This is go around and fuck every woman you possibly can strategy. That's the fun strategy. Right? Go just have tons and tons of kids. Um, and don't bother raising the kids necessarily. Either hope that some other guy comes along and helps the, the woman raise the kid or hope that she raises it alone and somehow succeeds and whatever. And just hope that you're going to have like, you know, dozens of these. And then you hope that some of those go through to the next generation and have grandchildren. Okay, so that's one strategy and that's very, very viable. The other viable strategy is this. Have a few, maybe like maybe two or three kids. Um, but then spend a lot of time and effort raising them, making them strong, helping them survive, giving, giving them access to resources so that they become very attractive. And then this smaller number of kids you're having is going to have a greater percentage of grandchildren. So those are the two sort of survival or replication and genetic strategies. Okay. Now, I like to name these two strategies. The first one, have a lot of kids. We'll name that the lover strategy. Be the lover have lots of kids, etc. The second one, get with one girl, be very loyal, have a few kids, raise them well, we'll label as the provider strategy. Okay? Um, and that's very, very, very critical to game, this distinction. Lover versus provider. Okay. Um, how many people have heard, we'll get into this actually tomorrow in, in game 202 a lot, but how many people have heard the idea of value and comfort in game? Yeah? Okay. So this here, high value guy, this is the Genghis Khan, right? This is the, I can fuck whoever I want. Um, I don't need to follow society's rules because I've shown that I'm in that top 1% and I can get away with it, right? The provider strategy is the much more sort of like, safe, stable strategy, right? You're never going to impregnate half of Asia with the provider strategy. But if you take the provider strategy, you are much more likely to have one kid get into the next generation and have a grandkid, right? So this is the much more like sort of like safe strategy. This is the much more like, you know, top, top strategy. However, when we go back to, to here, remember, oh, that's interesting. When we go back here, remember what the woman's looking for is not that average guy. Because the average guy in many societies evolutionarily got no women. All right? And one of the things that is the most attractive in evolution is that you could get girls, that you had sexual options. Because right? what does that say? If you had a lot of sexual options as a man and you're giving your DNA to the woman's children, that's a very high likelihood that her children will be sexually attractive. Okay, so when a woman's looking for sexually attractive, she's looking for those 1% characteristics. So you could say, and this is very, very critical, okay, a lot of game is simulating those characteristics of that top few percentage of society. All right. Now the ideal man, actually, what every woman is actually looking for is both of these. Okay, so we talked about the male strategy, lover versus provider. What's the female strategy? Right? What does the girl look for? Well, she has a few different strategies. Um, one strategy is to try and find the best combination she can. Right? So women have a paradox. On one hand, they want the most badass, alpha, sexy guy they can find. On the other hand, that man is in demand with a lot of women and has no reason to stick around with that particular woman. So she's very likely to end up alone raising a kid. Right? So it's a paradox. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, if she goes with the provider, goes with the guy that will stick with her, well, usually that's going to be a guy who has no better options than her. So that's not the most badass, sexy guy she could get. So that's the female paradox. All right? So they solve it in a few different ways. Um, one, one solution is they settle. They just find a provider, they hang on, and they just like play it safe. Because remember, again, women are risk averse. Right? And the genetic payout for women isn't so big with going with the alpha male. So sometimes they'll go with the provider. Um, sometimes what they will do is they'll look for the best combination. So instead of getting like a 10 out of 10 
lover guy um, or a 10 out of 10 provider guy, they'll get a guy who's like seven and seven, like he's seven at both, like a seven out of 10 attractive, seven out of 10 provider, and like, okay, well, that's a good combination. So I'll do this sort of combination strategy. I'll get the best guy that I think I can keep around. That's a very effective strategy. Another very common strategy, though, is this. They will get pregnant by this guy and have the kid raised by that guy. Right? That happens very, very often. Um, throughout evolution, throughout history, extremely common. Um, even nowadays, as of um, the last literature I read on this was circa like the late 90s, early 2000s. But as of that date, um, in some studies, up to 15% of children that they, in, in samples, were actually not fathered by the man raising them, a lot of times without him knowing. Okay? So that's also a very, very, very common strategy. Okay? So understand, this is what the woman's looking for. She's looking for the absolute best guy she can get, but also the guy she can keep around. And so she's looking for that mix of value and comfort. Okay? And again, we'll get into this tomorrow when we talk about value and comfort models. But understand, if you are the sexy guy who she like, is genetically attracted to, because attraction is not a choice, it's easier to start out being the guy she's attracted to and then convince her to trust you later than be the guy who's trustworthy but not attractive and then convince her you're attractive later. Okay? So for that reason, it's generally better to start in this category and move here than to try and start in this category and move there. It's a much harder transition to make. Okay? For example, like if a woman saw Genghis Khan, she'd be like, oh, that's a fucking alpha male. I couldn't keep him around, but then if she developed a bond with him and got to know him, she might be convinced. Whereas if she sees like a beggar on the street, it's going to be very hard for the beggar to convince her that he's Genghis Khan. Okay? So that's kind of how that works. All right? So it's, it's much easier to change a girl's opinion of what you are to her than it is to change your opi her opinion of what you are in the world or in life. So start with high value in life and then develop the connection as secondary. All right. Okay, so how does game work? Right? So we have this idea that you want to be a certain type of guy. Right? You want to be a certain type of guy. You want to convey certain types of, of characteristics. But how? How do you convince a girl that you are that top 1%? You're that lover guy. Or how do you convince a girl that you will be um, loyal to her and you're safe for her and will be good to her? What specifically does it? And um, if a girl really is assessing everything you are, can you even change that? Right? If you aren't... If you're not Tom Brady, can you get with you know, supermodels? Is that possible? Right? Because if it truly, if she's truly looking at everything and she's evaluating on some kind of like resume and like she has some sort of like matrix of characteristics, like some of us aren't, you know, celebrities and some of us aren't billionaires, is it still possible? All right, so now we're gonna get into um, more specifics of exactly what to think and what to do. All right, so we have kind of the, the, the underpinnings, the, the theory behind everything. And now we're going to bring it all together. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk inner game. Basics of inner game. Primary rule, primary idea of inner game before anything else is three simple words. You are enough. Okay? You're enough. And again, like I talked about on the social conditioning page a second ago, even if you're not perfect, if you can't change it, you're better off assuming you're enough. Okay? There's two types of guys. Um, that get success with girls, basically. Um, one type of guy is the guy who knows all the techniques in the world, knows the right response to everything, and just kind of techniques his way through it. That guy can get pretty good results. He usually doesn't get the great, like, t tip top results, but he can get pretty good results because he just, like, has an answer. He knows what he's doing. Right? Like, if one of you guys were to throw a shit, throw, somebody throw a shit test at me right now, anything. Nice belly. Man, those boots are. Thanks. Awesome. I work hard on it. I appreciate that. Huh? Those boots are just ugly. You think? Cool, well, cool opinion, bro, right? Um, like just not being reactive, not caring, whatever, like knowing an answer for a shit test, okay? That'll get you a long way. But it's not everything. It's not everything because it lacks soul, right? Um, again, here's, a, here's actually a good concept before we get to this. What is pickup? What is pickup and what are pickup techniques? It's this. And mind you, I'm making this definition up on the spot a little bit. But pickup essentially is this. It's conveying um, we'll call it ideal man qualities a 
actively and efficiently. And then from there, using that to connect, to form a connection. So that's the second stage. So first part is conveying those attractive qualities in an efficient way, in an active way. Like not just sitting against the wall being an alpha male from far away. You have to actually be in the girl's face and doing it, right? Letting her see those honest signals, conveying you're that guy. And then using the leverage you have from that to actually form a real genuine connection and make a good relationship. Okay, that's how I look at pickup. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so that's essentially what you're doing here. Um, so when we look at um, the you are enough idea, the guy who knows the technique, he's conveying these qualities, but he's, conve he's, he's conveying a fake of those qualities. So it's like he's smattering over the behaviors to cover up something underneath that's not there. Right? Better is to actually be that person. Instead of, instead, of just, instead of just conveying, what if you were being? Right? That's the ideal. That's what we'd actually like to get to. And that's what you like to create in life. Like, for example, I would bet, I don't know this for sure, but um, <clears throat> Cristiano Ronaldo probably has never studied formal pickup. I don't know that for a fact. Could be that he has. Don't know. But I would assume he probably hasn't. I assume he probably started getting laid at like 12 from groupies. And um, it's been pretty good for him ever since. Right? However, he may not know pickup theory and how to actively convey these things. However, I guarantee you he probably acts a lot this way. Okay? Uh, the guy I met who was the absolute best at game I've ever seen in my entire life um, had not studied formal pickup at the time that I met him. Okay, he actually, I met him, he actually came on a boot camp, interestingly enough. He had the best game I've ever seen, but he didn't know how to do an approach because basically he was that same scenario as like a Cristiano Ronaldo type. He was a soccer player in Europe. He had, um, since the age of 13, every time he left the field, he had a row of groupies waiting to fuck him and his teammates. Um, and... He just viewed girls as fun, silly, interesting things, but he had no ego attached to them, no entitlement issues whatsoever. Um, and quick story, um, basically his, his entire thing is he didn't know how to do a cold approach because he didn't know what to say. He's like, I don't know what to say to him because he'd always just been approached. Right? He'd been approached so many times he didn't know how to approach. So we taught him to say, we taught him to walk over to a girl and say, hi, my name is his name. That was the extent of his teaching on boot camp. That's all we needed to teach him. From there, he was good. And he, he, his mind was blowing. He's like, oh my God, you can do that? Um, and then he proceeded the first night of boot camp to take two girls home with one of the uh, instructors and have the two girls trying to ditch the instructor and have a threesome with him all night. Following night, different instructor, same story. Okay? This guy was that good. He was like insane. Um, he went, a couple weeks later, he went on like a, a vacation to like the Greek islands, which is kind of an orgy anyway. Um, but in like, I think he slept with like 15 girls in nine days or something like that. And just like, just poof. So yeah, he, he did all right. But his issue, he didn't know a lot of like, do this push pull, have this routine, convey that thing. But for whatever reason, because of how he grew up, what his experience was, he had learned a lot of the right things. And so he wasn't actively conveying these things. He was just being them, right? And that's actually the better way to be. The better way to be is to actually be it. And br that brings us to the second type of guy who gets results. So again, the first type of guy is the guy who has all the pickup technique. The second type of guy who can get results is what I like to call the it's always on guy. The it's always on guy. Basically, he just assumes that every girl likes him. You may have heard this phrase. Assume attraction. Not always good advice, but often good advice. Okay, Assume attraction. Because if you go in and you assume she likes you and you're right, you're going to be acting in the right way. If you go in and assume attraction and you're, and you're wrong, well, you know, she wasn't attracted to you anyway, you haven't lost much. Also, if you go in and assume attraction and you're wrong, the very fact that you're assuming she's attracted, it says you believe you are that alpha guy, that 1%, she might just be convinced. It might just win her over, all right? So assuming attraction is certainly better than the alternative. What do a lot of guys do? They do this. Assume. Rejection, right? A lot of guys go in assuming they're going to get rejected, and what happens? They get rejected almost every single time, right? So between these two, 
I'd rather be this and wrong than this and right any day of the week. Okay, so that's the other type of guy that gets results is the guy that is the it's always on guy. Um, so what I encourage you to do is be both. I encourage you to be the it's always on guy, go in assuming attraction, but also don't be clueless, right? Because there's also the it's always on guy that's clueless, he just like escalates all the time and is really pushy and doesn't calibrate to the girl, doesn't understand where he's at, doesn't know what she's feeling, that kind of stuff. Um, and that doesn't really get you very good results either. Okay, so you want to start out with assume attraction as your basis, and then you want to have the pickup technique um, as a fallback. And that's where you can do both of these, right? It's always on, it's always a, uh, assume attraction. It's kind of like being that guy a bit, and then knowing the pickup technique and knowing how to adjust is very much conveying that guy. So that's what we want to be doing with that, okay? But the core is you are enough. Second core idea besides you are enough. And this kind of goes along with you are enough, but it's, it's a little different. You are not an imposition, a burden, or an interruption. Okay? A lot of guys, they see a group of girls talking like, I don't want to interrupt them. I don't want to bother them. They, they seem like they're in such a good conversation. No. If um, Leonardo DiCaprio walked over and interrupted their conversation, you think the girls would be like, fuck off, Leo. <laughs> We're, we're talking about Mary's job right now. Fuck off. No, absolutely not, right? The reason guys think that is because they don't believe they are enough. They don't understand that they are offering value, all right? So you need to understand that. We'll talk in a second about exactly what offering value is, and that's important as well. But here's another key phrase. Um, this is pickup industry mantra circa 1999. That's kind of fallen by the wayside. Repeat this, everybody, like after me. It's actually important. I make no apologies for my desires as a man. Everybody say that. I make no apologies for my desires as a man. Good. I make no apologies for my desires as a man. It's okay to have a penis. It's okay to look at a girl and be attracted to her. It's okay to tell her that. It's totally okay. I know we grew up in like, you know, or at least I did, in um, you know, elementary school, middle school, even high school, where you know, if you have a crush on someone, it's like big gossip and it's like, ooh, Todd likes so and so, right? Whatever, right? doesn't matter, right? You are supposed to, as a man, like girls. If you didn't, it would be fucking weird, right? That's another social conditioning thing, right? Social shaming, all right? So don't, don't fall into that. I make no apologies for my desires as a man. That's absolutely critical, all right? So that's what we have so far. I am enough. I am not an imposition or a burden. And I make no apologies for my desires as a man. That should be your general frame, okay? Now, there's a lot of nuance within that, but that's your general frame. Um, now, I spoke a minute ago about offering value. What is offering value? What is value? Right? Well, there are a lot of different types of value. Right? And a lot of people, a lot of guys, they think value is what? Um, money and like, I don't know how to draw good looks. Like I'll draw like a fucking like chiseled male physique. I don't know. And like big biceps. That's a like terrible picture. But like money and good looks, sure. Um, that's what people think, oh, if I'm not rich and good looking, I have no value, right? Um, that's actually a very minimal part of value, right? Again, good looking is a bit of a genetic honest signal, but again, remember, appearance is less important for women, not that important for women, right? It's important for us as men, right? Because we're just looking for good genetic vessels to get our kids into the next generation. They're actually looking for ongoing support, you know, survival capabilities, ingenuity, intellect, all those kind of things. So looks matter, but not that much. Money. Yeah, it matters a little bit as a symbol, but that didn't even exist in evolution, right? So it exists a little bit as a symbol, but it's not really the biggest thing, right? <clears throat> what actually does provide value, a lot of it is, at least in modern society, it is your values, okay? And remember this, value comes from values. And actually, here's another phrase of this, is value exists within a frame. So both of these matter. Okay, so <clears throat> if you are in a nightclub, and the frame of the nightclub is that girls drink free, um, don't, don't touch the girls, or if they complain, you get thrown out, and guys have to pay a $100 cover, and these kind of things, right? 
If you go up to a girl and you're bought into that frame, are you going to be, are you going to have a, oh, let's put it this way. There's two people in this nightclub. One is a billionaire, one is a hot girl. In that nightclub frame, who has more value, the billionaire or the hot girl? The hot girl. Now in life, honestly, who has more value, billionaire or hot girl? Billionaire, right? But why is that? It's because within, within that context, they're in the frame of the nightclub. So if you are living within that frame, it's very hard to have value. Right? And most people are living through what frame? The societally conditioned frame, which is woman on a pedestal, man a little bit lower. And from that frame, it's very, very hard to have value. <clears throat> so understand value exists within a frame. <clears throat> so if, for example, let's take, take an example in the room. Uh, let's do you. What is something that you value? Anything in life. What's something that you, you care about or you value or think is important in life? For me? For you, yeah. Uh, what, what do I value? Uh, you know, I, I value probably uh, nice vacations. Okay. So, like vacations, you like the, you like the experience, like you like? Going, you know, going to the Caribbean or uh, Mexico or Cancun. Cool. So, tra travel, vacation. What do you like about travel and vacation specifically? Uh, I like being out on the beach, whether it be on a boat. Okay. Uh, so that's the experience. Yeah. What, what about that experience do you like though? What does it do for you emotionally or what does it do for you intellectually or what is it, what's, the, what's the experience of that to you? You know, it gives me a lot of good memories. <laughs> okay. And, uh, good times. Cool. Good experience. Brings up my mood. Memories. Cool. Cool. All right. So that's, that's a value, right? I like good experiences, have good memories, bring my mood up, that kind of stuff, okay? So if he's in the frame <clears throat> that what's important in life, <clears throat> excuse me, is money and prestige, and he talks about having a good experience and bringing up his mood, that's not very relevant in that frame. But if he talks within the frame of <clears throat> good experiences, um, having good memories, having being in a good mood is important, and he talks about having a great vacation, now all of a sudden within that context, what he's saying is of high value. Okay, so if you're able to <clears throat> dictate a frame, dictate a, a way of looking at the interaction where <clears throat> what you view as value is the um, accepted frame of value, then the things you talk about will have value. If you're in a frame of the interaction, if you're looking at the interaction through a lens that, that values other characteristics besides what you find valuable, you're inherently gonna be talking in a low value way. Does that make sense, right? <clears throat> Uh, we'll do another example. How about you? What is something you value? Loyalty. You value loyalty? Cool. Good. Cool. So loyalty. You value loyalty. What else? This is kind of weird, but I, I really like, uh, I think honor. Loyalty and honor. Cool. You guys will take the high road. You know, don't earn any. Awesome. Cool. All right. So if you were, um, <clears throat> if you were in a, uh, you're put in a room in a white collar prison, and everybody is discussing their little, like, their little scams and crimes and stuff like that. And you start talking about virtue and honor. Within the frame that they're thinking in, would your ideas of loyalty and honor have a lot of value? Not at all. Yeah. Not a lot of value. Not in, in that frame, because the established frame is different. right? So if you're accepting their frame, these things wouldn't have a lot, of, a lot of value. However, if you have dictated a frame, if you've created, like, they're, they're viewing you as an authority and you're talking on, on these subjects, and you're talking passionately, and they buy into it, then they might begin to have honor. They, they might begin to have value, right? Um, or, for example, in, a, <clears throat> in the context of maybe like um, a military context, loyalty and honor are very highly valued there. So if you were talking to, two, to people that were you know, very indoctrinated to that, and you were speaking on this, they might very much buy into it and find your words very, very valuable, okay? So when you go into a situation, there's the inherent frame, and if you're contrary to the inherent frame, you may have trouble getting value. And then there's also the, the frame that you choose or accept, right? So the key here is put yourself in situations where you're going to have a good frame to begin with. But even more so, don't accept frames that aren't helpful to you. Don't accept situations where the things you value aren't what is valuable in the interaction.